In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. The perfect law of liberty of which St. James speaks in today's epistle is one of the names of the new law. But in order to understand this better, let us see how great is the perfection of the new law of Christ and why. St. Thomas says that no greater law can be conceived of than the new law, and this from three points of view. First, on the part of the principle of the action, which is divine grace. Second, on the part of the end or motive, which is the love of God. And third, with regard to its precepts, which are especially interior. With regard to the principle or source of action, the new law is called the law of grace. With regard to the motive or end of action, it is called the law of love. The old law was a law of fear, but the new law is the law of love, because in it all things must be done for the love of God, which is the highest and most perfect motive that can be conceived of. With regard to the precepts, the law of the gospel is especially concerning interior acts, for all of its precepts are in included in the one precept of charity, that is, the love of God and the love of neighbor. Christ, in fact, did not prescribe any particular exterior acts apart from those which were necessary for grace, and he prohibited only those actions which are contrary to grace and the love of God and neighbor. For this reason, the new law is called the law of liberty. Today we celebrate the feast of St. Philip Neri and his school of spirituality and life wonderful, wonderfully illustrates this threefold perfection of the new law. St. Thomas says, quote, the new law consists chiefly in the grace of the Holy Ghost, which is shown forth by faith that worketh through love. This means that the new law consists chiefly in the Holy Ghost dwelling in us and sanctifying our soul by grace, making us children of God and allowing us to perform supernatural works of charity, which though done with our free cooperation, proceed principally from the Holy Ghost as from their source. Now, St. Philip Neri was deeply penetrated by this truth, and hence his spiritual doctrine and, in his direction of souls, his first concern and, and application was the acquisition of humility because pride is the greatest obstacle to the grace of God and to the action of the Holy Ghost in our souls, and hence of Christian perfection. <clears throat> in the measure that pride is reduced, to that same measure the Holy Ghost will act more intensely and efficaciously in our soul through his grace, through his inspirations, and through his gifts. Hence, we see that St. Philip lay a very special stress in mortifying all forms of pride, both in himself and in his penitence. Our saint gave the greatest prominence to spiritual and internal mortifications, and hence, he rarely imposed bodily mortifications such as fasts. Although his own bodily mortification was even excessive, he was most liberal and indulgent toward his disciples. Eat without scruple, he would say to them, whatever God has prepared for you at the common table. No delicacies, 
no dishes prepared on purpose for you, no gluttony. But whatever God provides for you, that take with simplicity of heart from his hands. As to himself, his only food was only bread and herbs. And so when fears were expressed that he might injure his, injure his health by his great abstinence, he would say with a smile, I eat little because I don't want to become fat like my friend Francesco Scarlatti. Here we see the characteristic good sense of humor of our saint, which never, however, offended charity, but only helped to keep a healthy cheerfulness in the service of God. Now as to the spiritual mortifications, he was unceasing and ruthless. In all else, he was ineffably gentle. In this alone, he seemed at times almost harsh, unjust, and without pity. But St. Philip's aim was to lessen, if he could not destroy, the harm of pride to our souls. He was wont to say, the whole stress of the Christian life is in the mortification of our reason that is, of the arrogant presumption of the understanding. Sometimes, to stress the necessity of mortifying the pride of the intellect, he would touch his forehead and say, All the holiness of a man lies here, within the breath of three fingers. Often he would say, My sons, humble your minds. Submit your judgment. At other times he said, The man who is not ready to bear the loss of his own honor and esteem for the sake of Jesus Christ will never make any progress in spiritual things. But St. Philip, like all the saints, taught far more by what he did than by what he said. It was not enough for him not to seek the vain glory which the world offers, but he longed for its derision and content. This led St. Philip to strive to appear to others as a foolish, ignorant, and worthless man, and hence to mortify himself in astounding ways. He was, for example, once invited by a great cardinal to a banquet full of persons of the highest distinction, and the saint made his appearance at dinner table, bringing in his own hand a metal bowl of lentils. When someone went to him in order to see the great saint of whom they had heard so much, he would start reading aloud some book on silly jokes and make them listen while it was being heard. On the appearance of cardinals, he began to jump about, to make jokes and laugh, just like a, like a simple and foolish person. And that he may not be regarded as a saint, but only a, as a foolish old man, he would go into the church with a gown turned inside out, and this over his cassock, and his beretta tilted to one side. In his time, priests wore long beards, and so he often had only one side of his beard cut off, and went thus through the city, taking the light when he was called a silly old fool. Now, needless to say, such sort of mortifications we may not imitate, but we are only to admire them. Yet they show the hatred of the saint for self-love and vainglory. And the lesson for us is to be patient when we suffer a humiliation against our will. 
on his disciples our saint imposed mortifications similar to those he practiced. So much so that one of St. Philip's friends and penitents said laughingly to another, I have no honor left, for Father Philip has taken it all away from me. The penitents would, at Philip's bidding, stand and beg at the door of the churches when they were most thronged. One was rather vain of a new fine garment, and so St. Philip sent him to St. Mary Major's to ask for alms among the most wretched beggars. To a young man he said, Go, my son, and ring this bell merrily all along the Via dei Giovanni. The young man obeyed at once, and as the street was full of people, he got well laughed at and even hooted as a madman. St. Philip had a bulky, heavy dog named Capriccio. This dog, some, someone had left him as an enforced gift. And the saint made good use of the dog to humiliate his disciples and to crush their pride. Once, for instance, he ordered one to carry this heavy dog in his arms along the streets of Rome. And so it happened that Father Taruji, a friend and disciple of the saint, described this dog as the cruel scourge of human minds. One whom he suspected of taking pride in his hair, he ordered to shave his head like a monk. All this our saint did out of pure charity for souls, in order, in order to empty them of their pride. Now we saw that the new law is also the law of love, inasmuch as all things must be done for the love of God. This is also a characteristic trait of St. Philip's spirituality and life. He used to say, He who works purely for the love of God desires nothing but his honor, and thus is ready in, every, in everything either to act or nor, not to act, and that not only in indifferent matters, but even in good ones, and he is always resigned to the will of God. Again, he used to say, tribulations, if we bear them patiently for the love of God, appear bitter at first, but they grow sweet when one gets accustomed to their taste. Now having himself a heart full to overflowing with the love of God, St. Philip's spiritual me method was naturally gentle and sweet, mild and full of compassion. Very rarely indeed do we meet with any instance of severity however carefully tempered. All his life was marked by an extraordinary sweetness of charity. He lived among men with a loving charity towards all alike, which nothing could worry or lessen. And even towards those who were inveterate in their sins, he manifested the greatest charity and invited them to confession by saying, For the love of God, my son, tell me your sins, for God is waiting to forgive them. He would say to his priests concerning penitence, Let our aim be to enkindle in their hearts the love of God, which alone can enable them to do great things. We saw that, with regard to the precepts, the new law is especially concerning interior acts, since all the precepts are included in that of the love of God and of neighbor. And that is why the law of the gospel is rightly called the law of liberty. This is that holy liberty of the children of God who, 
fulfilling the twofold precept of loving God and neighbor, fulfill the whole law, and hence enjoy true liberty. According to that saying of St. Augustine, love and do what you will. This holy liberty is also wonderfully seen in St. Philip's doctrine and life. To those who might scruple of shorting their prayers when fraternal charity called, he said, to live our prayer when we are called to do some act of charity for our neighbor is not really a quitting of prayer, but living Christ for Christ. Thus, he was a sworn enemy of any form of scruples. He used to say, I do not want to see any scruples, any low spirits. And again, my sons, be cheerful. I want you never to commit sin, but to be always cheerful. He said also, scruples ought to be most carefully avoided, as they disquiet the mind and make a man melancholy. Let us throw ourselves into the arms of God and be sure that if he wishes anything of us, he will make us good for all he desires us to do for him. St. Philip was then an example of how the new law is to those who embrace it lovingly, truly the law of the perfect freedom, because divine charity made him free from every kind of slavery free from the slavery of riches, of pleasures, and of the senses, free from all ambition, free from all low and groveling attachments, free from every bond that chains the soul to earth. This liberty, which is the liberty with which Christ has made us free, was the basis of St. Philip's immense influence for good, and for his leading so many souls to sanctity. Lastly, one of the secrets for St. Philip's true liberty of soul and sanctity was his tender love, love for and ch childlike confidence in the Blessed Virgin. The saint used to say, if the servant of God wishes to walk with more security, through so many snares scattered in every place, he should have our Blessed Lady as his mediatrix with her son. And elsewhere, he gave this maxim, to begin and end well, devotion to our Blessed Lady, the Mother of God, is nothing less than indispensable. And this he showed also by his example, since in all his temptations and needs, he asked the, the Blessed Mother for help with a childlike simplicity, and he was never let down. Hence, the saint delighted in impressing in his disciples a great love and devotion towards the Blessed Mother. Be sure of this, my sons, he said again and again, Believe me, for I know it well, there is no more effective means of obtaining graces from God than the Most Holy Virgin. And he urged his disciples to say many times with the greatest love and trust, Virgin Mother of God, pray to Jesus for me. Now let us conclude by asking our dear saint to intercede for us sinners and help us to persevere cheerfully until death in the service of God. Let us ask him for the grace to serve God, not out of fear, but out of love, since, as the saint says, this alone can enable us to do great things. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.